It should be starting in a second. There we go. It says we're live. Super duper. And uh, Vasco says we're live. Laura will tell us if we're not. Wonderful to see all of you. Thank you for coming along to the Squirrel Squadron live stream. Uh, these are our weekly events uh, where we welcome guests like Vasco, who I'll introduce properly in just a moment. And uh, I run these every single week as part of the Squirrel Squadron so that uh, tech and non-tech people can work together to make tech insanely profitable. That's what we're doing. So uh, if you wanted uh, to be somewhere else, if you wanted to learn how to cook or uh, 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 find out about old ha ancient houses, um, which is what we were talking about a minute ago, um, uh, you're in the wrong place. But if you're here to talk about tech and non-tech and how to get them working together, uh, then Vasco and I are, are folks who really care about that. And uh, I know Vasco from a couple of uh, editions of podcasts. I've been on yours and you've been on mine and other things. Um, and uh, Vasco is um, a, a super duper expert on uh, running your scrum team, but not only running your scrum team, running any technology organization, uh, how to do it effectively and profitably. And um, uh, uh, Vasco has written a whole book on uh, not using estimates, uh, which he's going to hold up for us. Fantastic. So we're not trying to sell you the book. Uh, I'm sure you can get hold of that by being nice enough to Vasco. Um, uh, but uh, the amazing thing is uh, I started talking about that Brett Vasco well before uh, I, I uh, found out that you had written the book. So um, I'm going to bug you a lot about that. Um, let me just say before we get started properly, uh, I just want to mention a couple of things about the Squirrel Squadron. Um, first of all, you can find us at squirrelsquadron.com. So I'll stick that up here in my uh, fairly uh, uh, simple way. Uh, so uh, uh, the group is uh, over a thousand members now. Um, we have um, these weekly events. We have a forum where you can comment and ask questions. We'd invite all of you to come on the forum and, and uh, talk a lot about the controversial things Vasco and I are going to discuss. Um, we have a resource list with hundreds of different uh, events and people and podcasts and um, information sources from all different uh, locations. Uh, so the squadron's alive and well doing lots. One thing I should say is we have a live event in London on the 12th of January. So love to see any and all of you in person. And uh, again, you can come argue with us about all the provocative things that, uh, that we discuss in the squadron. Uh, and it's open to anybody who's technical, non-technical, executive, non-executive. Um, love, love to have you in. Great stuff. So Vasco, let me let me uh, get started uh, with uh, uh, provoking you, and I, I may not have to say anything else because I know <laughs> I know you're going to have lots to say. Um, maybe maybe we really need estimates because engineers need something to do. I mean, engineers need to know what's going to happen next, and if they don't have estimates, how the heck are they going to know? Yeah, absolutely. So first of all, let me say that uh, I'm happy you said making tech insanely profitable because the first thing i have to say is that you don't if you don't plan to do something with software that is supposed to be insanely profitable you probably shouldn't be using software to do it and that is actually related to your question because of course what we do next is a very broad question in the context of a project we very likely know what we should be doing next. But we don't need estimates for that. I mean, you get into any team and you ask, uh, let's say all of the team members separately, one-on-one, -on -one, hey, Jennifer, what do you think we should be doing next? Hey, Marshall, what do you think we should be doing next? Hey, Anne, what do you think you should be doing next? And if you ask all of them separately, they'll probably come with a very roughly similar, you know, there will be a large overlap between what they say. But when you start planning, you go far beyond that. Right? It's not what we should be doing next, it's what we should be doing next, and then after that, and then after that, and then after that. And if you usual, usually, if you attach the normal value that many organizations attach to the planning process, you will realize that actually what we are asking the teams is to make promises. And to make promises that they then are going to be held up to, or you know, they're going to be uh, held accountable for those promises even when if you would go around the team and you would ask them what do you think we should be doing next they would all agree and it wouldn't be something in the plan and this is where everything goes wrong because immediately we create an environment where the team's doing what they think is the best thing to do goes against the plan and what do most teams do uh, anyone that loves to have a salary at the end of the month, they'll just follow the plan. Because if they don't, you know what happens next. And right? then they, they start call... to believe in the plan. 
And that's where it really gets dangerous is they start saying, we ought to be done. We ought to cut this corner. We ought to change this. We ought to make sure that we're done. And and that's the most dangerous of all. Yeah, I mean, self-fulfilling prophecies are the worst prophecies of all, right? Like uh, uh, somebody said once that, uh, 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 what is it? Uh, we lie all the time and we are the easiest person to trick, right? Like we lie to ourselves all the time. And if you think about it, the planning isn't just a self-fulfilling prophecy for the team, right? It's also for the management layer and the stakeholders and the customer. I mean, how many teams that you know have been bothered because some sales uh, person had made a promise to a customer? Hey, the engineers are making promises all the time. I think I'll make some. And, and that becomes a plan. Like the moment you say something to someone, that becomes an expectation. That becomes a plan. It may not be documented. It may not be estimated. It may not be detailed. But it's now a plan that somebody is going to hold you to, right? Indeed. So wh when you think about that, I'm starting to think, wait a minute. But we do have this thing. I mean, I know it's a very niche thing, but, you know, it's called Agile. And it has this thing called, you know, responding to change over following mm -hmm. a plan. And and this the is Agile 2000... Manifesto. Lots of us have forgotten it. And this is 2022. We're having this conversation. I, I thought this was cutting edge in 2004 when I started. And here we so are I. I still remember. assigning too much cutting edgeness to this, you know, compared to the evolution of our industry. And, and that's a sad that's a sad uh, state of affairs, if I have to, certainly to be honest about it. Well, well, let me just come in for one second, Vasco, because I realize I didn't do something I normally do, which is to encourage people to disagree with us. So we're saying very provocative things here. And what I'd love for everyone to do who's uh, on this call is please jump in with questions and comments. They, the chat is right there for you. Uh, these go better. They go longer with more content and more interesting discussion if you ask questions. So feel free to not ask questions. We'll just get done sooner and, and I'll go walk the dog. <laughs> but I think that you guys might have some really excellent questions. You might disagree with us because we're busy spouting heresies over here, right? We're telling you that you can get by without estimates, that um, uh, your, your promises are, aren't worth the paper they're not written on. Um, uh, please tell us where you disagree with us. Uh, but while, while people are coming up, with their questions, Vasco, so I'm, I'm wondering uh, what you think uh, about the role of, of methodology. You're a Scrum master. So where does Scrum fit into this? Do we need Scrum? Do we need Kanban? Uh, which book should we read? Yeah, that's a very good question. So uh, first obviously of all, I your book. You Sorry, I should have said that. But um, <laughs> yes, which, definitely. Which methodology you should books definitely should we read. To? No estimates, right? That's that's the first book you should read. Actually, uh, what I would say is that um, when it comes to methodology, there's a lot of great knowledge out there. Uh, the books I prefer are those that are written by people that were actually doing it. So anything that uh, uh, somebody who's actually been working with a process has written is worth checking out. Uh, and, and there's quite a lot in our community. We still have, maybe it will change over time, but we still have many practitioners out there. I mean, the Scrum Master Toolbox podcast that I host is all about interviewing practitioners. So people that are actually doing it, not, not just theorizing, like struggling with, you know, real day-to-day -day issues like planning and the fact that plans don't hold and, and sharing what they've learned and, you know, how they, how they handle it. Uh, so I would definitely go with books written by practitioners, you know, any of them, whatever those you can find, just go with those. And specifically, when it comes to uh, uh, methodology, we need to look at what are the real problems we're trying to solve. Like we, the people doing the work, right? Like not the people selling the the, the frameworks or, or, or ideas, but the people doing the work, we need to ask ourselves, what problem am I trying to solve? Because one of the confusions that I, I see a lot in the teams that I work with is that they think that the problem to solve is to be more accurate with the planning, i.e. for the reality in the future to be sim more similar to what they thought in the past when they built the plan. And I'm like, but that's not a problem worth solving because if the reality isn't what you planned it to be, it's because the reality is telling you, wake up, it's not going to work. Yeah, right. I was driving to London yesterday. I had someone I had was in a taxi where we were driving, and um, we were headed to London, and we expected to go one way, and there was it was full of traffic, and um, you know the road was just full of cars, and nobody was moving, and the person who was driving is much smarter than me, knows his way around London, said, I'm, "We're going this way," 
if we had stuck to the plan, I'd still be in London, right? We would be, <laughs> we, we wouldn't be talking. So that's, it's so amazing that in so many spheres of our lives, we follow um, the, the kind of sensible approach you've just described, but um, and, and we're willing to adjust to what has changed. But in software, for some reason, we think we can predict the future. I don't know what uh, came over us. What made us think we could do that? Not only that, but we then feel very guilty about not being able to. Exactly. Right. So it's we're like... here to absolve you of your guilt. We're, 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 we'll, <laughs> yes. Uh, you can Go be sad peace. about what happened. This is your your sins have been forgiven. I, I say transform guilt into grief. So <laughs> it's okay for you to be sad that you didn't know. I, I didn't understand that this library would be impossible to work with, or that this vendor would be super slow, or that um, our customer would change their yeah. mind. I'm sad about that, but don't waste time being guilty about it. Figure out what to do instead. Uh, Vasco, we have some really great questions. Um, so you mind if we jump to those? Let's do it. Excellent. So we've got Emily who says, uh, hey, Vasco. So she's asking you, Vasco. I'll, I'll, I'll answer, but I don't mind that Emily asked you. <laughs> Hi, Emily, by the way. Um, she says, when your funders are talking about what are you going to deliver in Q1, Q2, et cetera, what would you advise? I'll just add to that that I've got a client whose funders is asking what they're going to do in 2026. So um, what, what, what do you do with those kinds of questions? This is a, first of all, it's a great question. It's also a question, Emily, that I am asked all the time. I'm a consultant. So when I go to work with uh, clients, uh, even before a, a contract is signed, they ask me, so how are you going to do it? Mm -hmm. Right. So I'm intimately familiar with the fact that you, we have to whip up something. Whatever that something is, however, must not be a detailed plan. Right. And the way I look at it is that, OK, what they're asking for is a conversation of setting expectations. Right. So, for example, I, I started a gig some months ago and, and it's about deploying uh, a way of working called Lean User Experience, Lean UX, that uh, um, Jeff Gotthelf and Josh Saden wrote about. And it's about deploying that into an organization uh, that is not yet using it. They're using Scrum, but they're not using Lean UX. Okay, cool. So th they asked me, so what are you going to do? And, and of course, I had to give them some idea of what I was planning to do, right? Like, first of all, I want to do an assessment. I want to know, you know, how are things working right now? What, what are the teams that are starting to adopt? What are they doing? The teams that haven't yet even started to adopt, what are they doing? And we came up with a plan. The plan had four points. This is a six-month uh, agreement, right? Six month contract, four points, right? And those four points were just expectations that both the client and myself had about the work, right? And the contract started, there's even a, a statement of work, an SOW, which is very common for this type of clients, that says that those four points are going to be reviewed as you know, uh, as a performance evaluation of the contract. And, and I take those four points very seriously. But that's not a plan I'm going to follow every day, right? Like right now, I'm spending most of my time talking with product managers at that client, while that was the fourth of four points. There were three other points that we haven't been able to start because the project, product management situation in the organization isn't conducive to bring the other three points on board. There were roadworks right, so, in the way and there was a, a traffic jam over here and there was something else, but you can get going on number four. But I can I can go to the funders, in this case, the client and say, hey, here's what I've observed. Here's the obstacles. Here's my suggestion of what to do next. And they can tell me, you know, take a stroll. We're not working with you anymore. They can do that. But they saw the logic of it and said, yeah, that makes sense. Let's go with that course of action. Right. So, but they, this were four points. So four lines for six months. And that's totally different from the question. What will you be doing or delivering over six months? Because very often we interpret that question. I mean, we meaning engineering organizations, we interpret that question as give me a shopping list of everything you're going to get me from the supermarket. Oh, and First by the way, all, just tell me what order you're going to do them in. And, and on February the 29th, I, I want to be organizing my, I want to coordinate with you. So what, what exactly will you have done? Maybe at four o'clock on February the 29th. Can you tell and me what you'll And in some domains, that may make sense, right? Exactly. If you're, if you're doing, if you're, if you're cooking a dinner for a person you know very well, you're very intimate, and you're doing a dish that you've done a hundred thousand times, 
you're not going to worry too much. You write the shopping list, you go to the supermarket, you get it, you do it, it's fine. If you're doing a, a dinner for like 20 people and you're you know, preparing a three-course meal that you've never done in your life, you're going to do a list, but you forget the list immediately to start wor working on it because obviously you need to adapt all the time, right? So like th this is the important part. I think that we need to look at the conversation with funders in many different aspects. And one of the aspects is that, that I just shared, which is expectation setting. When we look at it as defining a detailed plan we must follow, then we are all losing. The funders are losing and we are losing. Absolutely. Vasco, let me try an analogy on you, which I use a lot when people ask a question like Emily's. And, and I'm going to wind up, uh, Emily, answering your question in an even more radical way. Vasco may or may not come with me. But, but let's try the analogy first. Um, because you said there are cases where this actually matters. One that I love, I, I think we just launched, well, we, the, the U.S. just launched a, a rocket to Mars. Uh, no, the moon. It was the moon, Artemis, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah, they're going to the moon. The moon. I have to talk about going to Mars, um, like our, our friend uh, Elon Musk. Um, and when you do something like that, you have to make sure you launch at the right time. Because February 29th at 4 o'clock, if you don't launch then, the moon won't be there. So it's kind of important that you be very predictable. So those are cases where it matters, but that matters because of kind of an accident of how those things work. We would like them to work differently. And so what I often say is, look, if, if you're Elon Musk and you want to get to Mars, I, I think maybe he should stay there when he gets there, but that's another story. Um, but, um, <laughs> but if you're Musk and you want to get there, the best way we know right now is to climb on top of a huge amount of explosive material and bring a book because you're going to close the lid and you're going to read your book and eventually uh, you're going to open the lid and you're going to be on Mars. There's really nothing you can do to change what happens. You can do an extra burn here or there and you can change it just a tiny bit, but you're moving uh, you know, a few hundred meters. You're not moving to a different, you can't go to Venus if Venus looks more interesting. But we've imagined other and better things and they're actually much more interesting. We, you, know, you wouldn't watch a, a tele program about uh, people who are going to Mars probably because it would be really boring most of the time. They just be sitting there reading their book, sleeping. But you do watch tele programs about people in spaceships and where what they have is the Starship Enterprise. And what you do when you're John Luke Picard or whoever and you're in the, the Captain Kirk and you're in the Enterprise is you can say, well, hang on a second. Uh, you know, this is very interesting. There's an asteroid over there, and actually there's an emergency on, on Pluto, so, so I'm going to change my mind and go someplace else. And if you had the opportunity to do that, I'm sure Musk would rather do that, right? You could, you could adjust it. He could come back and rescue Twitter or whatever else, whatever crazy thing he needed to do. Um, you could adjust your plan. The only reason that we have unchangeable plans for rockets is we don't have the Starship Enterprise. So here's the more radical answer to, uh, to Emily's question, which is um, I might give four points and I might say we're going to be ready to adjust those, but I would say nothing about how I was going to do it. I would say, and I counsel people, you know, the ones who are, uh, you know, trying to predict what they're going to do in 2026, I say, do answer that question because the funders need to know they're giving you a lot of money. They, they need to know that you're going to achieve, say, market dominance in the UK by uh, 2023. Fantastic. But you don't have to say in what market and you don't have to say in what um, uh, with what revenue stream or you don't have to say with what product. You have to say, look, we're going to adjust as we go. We, we might discover the, the, the right products on Venus, right? It's not on Mars. So we're, we're going to be willing to change our plan. We're still going to get to the same outcome. And I'm sure that Vasco, your, your client is saying, hey, hey, Vasco, we need to be using this uh, methodology, this lean methodology. But if you came back and said, hey, hey, we're going to use the methodology, but we've adjusted it in this way. We're going to change it in that way. We're going to make it more successful for you. And you're going to get the outcome that you asked for. They'd be happy. And that's so, the, Emily, that's, that's the way the I would answer that question for your for your that's, funders. That's ahead, the Vasco. key. That's the key word. Uh, so, if I would add something to that uh, answer, is to uh, focus on that word that Squirrel just used: outcomes. It's perfectly okay to have a list of outcomes with a timeline, right? The the way I usually tell teams is that you can do anything people ask you to do in whatever time they ask you to do it, as long as you define how. The problem mm -hmm. is when the plan is the how. And when the plan is the how at the team level, then the team's got no flexibility, right? And you can't adapt if, if, you're, if you're already telling yourself we're going to do exactly this, this way at this time. You lost all flexibility. Even the good old project management has a triangle and you know that you need to flex one of those sides, right? And, and a lot of the plans are actually the opposite, right? They're fixing the triangle. That, that's impossible. It's not going to work.
and you get locked into so many choices that you don't want to make. So um, until Musk came along, if I if I'm not mistaken, things like the space shuttle, we're still using the type of computer memory that they used on Apollo and back in the 1960s. And the reason they were doing that was because that was known technology. And if you worked with it, you could predict when you would actually launch the rocket, which in their world is very important. In our world, we want to be able to take advantage of new things that come out. You know, nobody dreamed that we'd be able to type in um, a, a, a beautiful seascape and have a computer draw a beautiful seascape for us. We didn't know that at the beginning of, of 2022. If you're doing something in the world of art, Doll E and, and all its friends are, are now giving you the opportunity to do things you never knew you could do. And uh, if you want to be stuck with the technology of the 1960s, be super predictable. Okay, uh, that's enough ranting on that topic. Emily, I hope we've helped you. We've got a, a raft of questions here. These are really great. Um, and we may not get to all of them. So let's just try to knock them all down, Vasco. And, and uh, um, I, I'm going to forget my, my uh, topics here. We may get to a few of them. Um, Nat Nigel says, agreeing totally so far. Don't worry, there's some people who disagree with this, Vasco. They're, they're coming soon. So folks who disagree, we're, we're coming to you. Don't worry. Um, challenge for me is educating people. Let's go out now. You, you and I both have podcasts and live streams and all the rest to try to tell people in general. But what, what do you say to your client when they say, uh, "Hey, hey, Vasco, what about these four points? You know, what are you doing on February the 29th? How do you help them understand, or, or do you?" Yeah. So, so I, I get this question a lot, Nigel. And the first thing I tell people is that you first need to believe in it yourself. Uh, if you don't believe in it, don't try to change anybody else's mind. And the other thing that happens is that, for example, if I talk about no estimates, which is something that totally changes how we do planning in uh, uh, software development or product development projects. If I believe in that, I actually don't need estimates. And if the customer says, hey, but we need to point all the stories, I'll just create a, a script that assigns random points to the stories and the job is done because I believe that you don't need story points to make effective decisions and to learn what capacity you have as an organization and then as a team and therefore adjust your execution as you go through your plan. So I, I don't think that we need to focus on educating others. I think that we need to focus on educating ourselves. And, you know, uh, this is a, a kind of a, a, a thought experiment Imagine you're in an estimation meeting. Everybody's, you know, telling them, telling you that, you know, I think this is a three pointer or a five pointer or one day playing or poker, five days. I'm playing my cards. Yep. Whatever, whatever poker they are playing. But the moment you you're in that meeting, and now imagine that in one moment, because of a you know a, um, lightning bolt, immediately everybody stops believing in estimates. What happens to that meeting? It I imagine that uh, we have a very different meeting, but tell tell us. It it disappears. There's no more meeting, because if if the if the core of the meeting is to come up with some quantification of work, whatever it's in time, complexity, whatever you want to do it, and nobody believes in that, then then there's no point in doing it anymore, and it stops right there. So that's why I say to people that first convince yourself. Once you understand. Once you know that it is possible to deliver without estimates, then you're not going to worry about it. This is what I tell the teams that I work with. Some of them still say, hey, but we need to point this. And I say, well, if you do want to point this, that's great. I'll leave the room because I don't need the information. You go ahead and do it. I don't try to change them. That's not my problem, right? But I don't let them make decisions without showing them, hey, guys, I know you think that this is only 25 points, and that's why you can do it in the next sprint. But you're actually taking 20 stories into a sprint where in the past you've only completed five to seven. So this don't match. What yeah. happened? And all your pointing hasn't given you uh, a, way, a right, way around that uh, yesterday's weather rule. Hasn't told you uh, why you're going to be able to do more. Uh, but the client really wants it. They want it by the, the 29th of March. This um, is why we take it, right? Yes, this exactly. Is why, this and, is why and, we end yeah. up taking it and under. All you're doing is fooling yourself, <laughs> indeed. So uh, uh, I'll give. I'll tell you how I do it, uh, Nigel. And certainly, like uh, um, Vasco's way, I certainly would not um, waste my time in an estimation meeting with with one of my clients. Um, what I tell them is to look for what what. And I agree that you need to um, uh, be convinced yourself. And and some of you who are disagreeing with us later. Uh, you're saying, hey, uh, this would be nice, but uh, uh, this, this I don't see how it would work for me. 
if you are uh, seeing that there's value in it, then what I do is I don't try to convince anybody, but I do look for ways that what I'm proposing will uh, do a better job of what they're interested in, what's in their best interests. And I'm looking for a common interest rather than our positions. So Emily's saying, uh, yeah, we, we, we uh, gave them a list of things um, and uh, flexibility on whatever comes up. Um, but they really wanted X would be ready on the 30th of March. So Emily, I can't argue with uh, that approach. Uh, that I'm, I'm sure that'll be helpful. Here's one thing that you might do as well, which is to say, what are you trying to accomplish with the X on the 30th of March? Someone further down, Lev says, um, you know, the client has a launch party and uh, they have 100 people going to start using the software in four weeks. They're going to lose money if we don't deliver. Let me tell a story about that that may help both of you. I had a client who literally had bought the balloons. They, they had the uh, a, a whole big um, customer event happening. They were going to demo the new flexible API, the new mechanism of using the software and how much it was going to be better. And the marketing folks literally had everything lined up. So the engineers were completely convinced that they had, had were locked in to this unchangeable plan. I think it might have even been the 30th of March. I don't remember. But whatever it was, there was a date. And there were balloons and they told me squirrel we can't do anything i said we need to find out more about these balloons we need to figure out more why is the marketing department remember the marketing department sells our product they tell us about how our product works they don't install our product we better find out more so we went off to see the marketing people and what they said was we need to make a big splash about this and we need to make it at this time because that's when the buying decisions will be made for the next financial year so we need it to happen here and we said does it need to work and my team was looking at me like I landed from Mars and, and just got off the rocket for with Elon. And they said, Squirrel, what are you asking? What do you mean? Does it have to work? I said, well, just bear with me. And they said, well, I guess it doesn't have to work. We need to be able to demo it. But um, yeah, it's going to take them months and months to buy it. And then months and months after that to install it. So yeah, I, I don't know that it has to work. And I said, could we show you a mocked up version that does work? We're not going to lie to anybody, but it'll work in our case. It'll work. Um, on the screen when we're demoing just for our exact, uh, exact use case. Um, do they have to get their hands on it? They said, no, 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 none of them are technical. They aren't going to go work with the API. They just need to see that it works with this and that and the other thing. So they make their buying decision. We said, great. So we went off and we changed the plan. And the plan then delivered a very narrow slice of the functionality, enough that they could demo. They had the balloons. The customers were extremely happy. They bought lots of stuff. And uh, in good time, in an appropriate amount of time, the developers were able to deliver. So mm -hmm. the answer there isn't necessarily build a thin slice, although I'm a big fan of, big, of thin slices. We may get into that. But the lesson is, go ask what the interest is. Why do they actually need it by then? And if the interest is even something simpler and more pragmatic, which is, I just want to have a date I can talk about, it's perfectly OK to commit to a date to deliver something. Mm -hmm. the Even problem is yeah, that something with some description, like it'll be a valuable API, just not. And it doesn't what matter the because be. whatever that something is, you start working on it right now, right? Mm -hmm. You don't do a three month plan and then start working on the thing you plan to deliver the last month of the three, right? You go like, if X is what we need to deliver by the 30th of March, it's going to be ready by the 30th of January, just to make sure. We're going to get that ready because, you know, there can be delays. And, you know, I, I, we have data on, on the book where we talk about uh, average project delays, and that's around 60%. Okay. So that means that at, that you seems know, zero, low. Uh, I, that's I think, the I average. Think your, your data, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think that's your data the is average. You, you, you yeah. Have no, because there. No, <laughs> most of it's 80 well, 90%. We, we can talk about it. I have some data for you, but, but the, the point is that that's the average, which means that. If you are anywhere around the average, you have to count on at least 50% more time, right? But of course, you have to be ready for being be, you know, beyond average, right? And, and we talk about delay in the book, we talk about delays of you know, 250% and so on. So if X is what matters and the 30th of March is the date that must be met, then we first work on X before we work on anything else. And, and I also, that's one of the things that I worry about when I talk to teams is that they think that somehow there is an only one sequence for doing work, right? And you already talked 
uh, about one of the tools we use in the agile world called slicing that tries to go around that sequence because mm -hmm. many of us work in organizations that they're that are divided uh, along component lines right so there's component a team component yeah. b oh, team you're, you're component hurting my ears, team. Vasco. oh but that's lines. how it Front goes back and team Yes, exactly. Front and back end team, and why not middleware and data lake and you know oh, all yeah. of those things. And then Absolutely. you start to see like this layered cake where all of the layers are developed separately. Not only that, but now there are multiple teams working on each of the layers. They all have their plans and interruptions and surprises and and sicknesses and so on. And now we we've made it so that it's sequenced so that the layers come online exactly at the right time. So we go with the lowest layer first, and when that's ready, we call the layer, the second layer, then we call the third layer, and all happens in the perfect time because it looks perfect in the Gantt chart, and we deliver on the 30th of March. Of course, we don't, right? We deliver maybe on the 30th of March the year after, but definitely not that year, right? And when we talk about slicing, this slicing is a great tool to discover alternative ways to deliver something on time, right? So if we do the slice for X, we do only what we need to do for X along the whole architecture. And, you know, I, I'm sure there will be some crap choices made. That's fine. We refactor. Oh, and, and Vasco, uh, you know, it, there's a problem with that, which is uh, us engineers, we know that if we could do each of the pieces separately, we'd be faster. So if everybody would just leave us alone for, for three months, we could do the first slice, first bottom piece, and then the next piece in the front, then the back, and then the middleware, then the front end. Just leave us alone for that period so that so we can get it done. Won't, won't that be better? Because we'll be faster. It's going to take longer your way. I'm being sarcastic here. I, I, I'm giving you a softball. <laughs> no, of course, because being alone is one of the reasons why the layering, the architectural layering fails, right? So, I mean, there are patterns to solve that problem too, right? Like, so uh, extremely well-defined and stable APIs are a good way to differentiate between teams that can't, for whatever reason, maybe they are in different parts of the world, cannot communicate uh, regularly, like, you know, several times a day, et cetera. Uh, if you have like 10 hours time zone difference, you, you want to have very strict APIs between those teams. You don't want to do, you know, like this a very fast agile development between those two teams. You want to do separate development. You want to s create a very strict contract in the form of the API between the two teams. And you want to have double-sided testing or contract testing to make sure the API is really doing what it needs to do, et cetera. So there are ways around this, but the problem is when you when we leave engineers alone, this is a very good point. When we leave engineers alone, what do they do? They optimize for engineering questions. And not that they, they are best the practices. Wrong. It's so dangerous. I never let anybody use best practices. And it's it's not that it's bad or wrong to optimize for engineering questions. Is that if you want to deliver on time, engineering questions are not the ones we should be optimizing for. We should be optimizing for delivery, right? For uh, assurance of delivery, right? We should be optimizing for quality. We should be optimizing for vertical slicing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Cool. Um, look, we've got so many questions. I could go on about this, and I'm sure you could too, Vasco, but but let's see if we can get to some more of these because they're really great. Um, uh, Jessica says, um, I agree in theory. In practice, not all engineering teams are mature enough to uh, where they can drive what's next. And when they haven't been empowered, you don't get a consensus. What's the way to safely move toward this in steps while going on a journey to educate and empower the engineers? Uh, I'll let you take that one first, Vasco. Yeah, I think the, the first step of the journey is to empower the engineers and hold them accountable. There's a very simple thing to do here, which is, and you know, uh, all of the uh, XP or extreme programming fans out there are probably uh, already answering this in their minds. If you do TDD, you always know what you're delivering. It may not be what you need, but you always know what you're delivering. Now, if we if we add to and that, just for people except, who don't know, because not everyone here is technical, test driven development is what Vasco is referring to. Keep going. And if you add to that acceptance test driven development, then you know you're delivering the things you promised you were delivering. Now, if we build that into a process, what are we doing? This TDD or test driven development and ATDD acceptance test driven development are just tools to do something very simple, which is give enough freedom to people so that they can deliver quickly, but then build the system so that they get the feedback 
to know that they are doing what they should be doing. So on top of ATDD, what I would add is something like Lean UX or customer interviews or regular customer demos, if you are allowed to demo to customers, not everybody is, but at least demo to customer proxies so that you get the, the, the feedback immediately. Now, if you do that, if you build those feedback loops for your team, I guarantee they will always know what to do next together with the product owner, together with you know business analysts, whoever needs to be part of the decision-making process, right? Not, not just engineers doing those decisions alone. I want to be clear about that because we're talking mm -hmm. about a team sport. Product yeah. and software development is a team sport. But, but if we build you may those take feedback, the wrong next step, right, Vasco? So, so it might be that as you, long you as you to... get the feedback, you you yeah. immediately recover from it, right? That's the idea. So um, I hope we're helping Jessica there. Uh, I will just add that um, I wouldn't be focused on educating the engineers. Um, I think that education is going to happen naturally. Um, and I wouldn't focus necessarily on um, whether they're mature enough. Um, that's that's an important question. That's a management question, which I think it, you're right to, to raise and to pay attention to. But um, it feels to me, it's certainly what I observe over and over again, and, and I, I think I'm reading your question correctly, uh, that if the team isn't mature, um, if they get frequent feedback, they're going to be okay because they're going to hear and learn very quickly what it is that the customers need. They'll probably get to know that better than you, Jessica. So um, uh, I'd say if the team is really green and immature and uh, really doesn't understand what they're doing, that's when I would do faster iterations. That's when I would yes. do more customer feedback. Shorter that's when I would get iterations. more. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so that they can learn more quickly. Um, so I, 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 this is a case where I, I would move it toward in steps, but steps that might happen every single day, right? So I yeah. talk to teams Feed, a lot. Feedback, feedback is your best friend, right? Like exactly. there are many every different day. types of feedback. Yes, every yeah. day. Exactly. Actually, this is one of the things I talk about in the No Estimates book, which is this idea that I want to move teams to deliver stories every day. Now, it's not how many points does this story take. It's, can you deliver it by the end of the day? And if not, you slice that story into two stories and you deliver one today and the other slice tomorrow. And <clears throat> this helps us to get that very clear feedback. It also gives us options, right? Because if there's something you haven't delivered yet, you can drop it and forget about it. That's very important decision-making as well. So I, I would say that, that just like Squirrel said, the feedback loops are what drive up the maturity of the team. Great. And uh, there's a great example. I won't try to do it here because I'll probably mix up the, the technology. I, I managed to disconnect my camera before we got started. But there's uh, if you go look at my uh, Twitter replies, you'll see that one of my client replies to someone who was saying uh, slices don't exist. You can't do this. I'm, I'm not sure he was uh, really serious about it. But she replied with this wonderful example of uh, a ton of different um, slices that my client and, and uh, under her leadership had, had created. And, and Steph went through each one, and they're really tiny. And this is the sort of thing that people often miss, is when Vasco and I say every day, we really mean every day. And so the first thing that, that team created was a page that didn't work, like a page that was blank, a white screen, right? There's nothing there. And you might say, well, how on earth could that give me value? How could that steer me there? Well, how did I get to the page? Well, I clicked a button. Is the button in the right place? Does it say the right thing? Do customers know what that button's for? Should the button be a different color? There's all kinds of questions you can answer with a blank page. So getting very, very thin slices and getting very frequent feedback on very small amounts of code is something almost every team can do with some guidance and help from a smart person like you, Jessica. And that then you can get very rapid feedback and their learning is, is exponential. It's really amazing. And by the way, engineers like myself do this intuitively. Like when I started programming, I put printfs everywhere and I was running the program all the time. I was yep. getting feedback all the time. We have to now, teach them how not to do it, Vasco. We're nuts. How are, why exactly, are we teaching exactly. them not to do now, what they do I'm naturally? Not, I'm not suggesting you do printfs these days. There are much better tools for that, but I'm giving you an example that intuitively we already know that having this very short feedback, and in TDD, we talk about the matter of minutes feedback cycle, that's very powerful and drives up the quality, drives up the maturity, increases also the ability to find new ways to solve a problem that we didn't even think about. So like, we need to take advantage of that. And really, Agile, if it is about one thing, it is about driving down the feedback loop so short 
that it becomes almost economically untenable. That's when you stop making it shorter. Because there it, there's so many advantages you get from short feedback loops. So a uh, big fan. Okay. Uh, and Daniel asked a good question about this and we're jumping around in the questions. Don't worry. I'm going to try to get to everybody, but Daniel, you're building on something here. I want to uh, make sure that we cover. Daniel says, when you're using TDD for accountability, do you mean that the product owner helps specify test cases up front? No, that's not what I mean. At least I'll let Basco go in a second, but um, for the non-technical folks, Test driven development is a way of writing code in really short chunks with this very fast feedback loop uh, in the matter of seconds, really. You write a line of code, then you test it. Um, so you're getting this really fast feedback for yourself on whether you're building what you want to. And the, the value of that is that you're making sure that there's readable, understandable documentation for what you're building that other people can read and that they can check to see whether, okay, in real time, if they want to, uh, what are the tests that Squirrel's creating. And Vasco can come along and say, Squirrel, you've just written three tests that are they're really wrong. <laughs> These don't make any sense. You should stop doing that. Vasco doesn't have to read code to be able to do that. And we could go on about narrative tests and all kinds of other methods. A ask me in the forum if, if you want to know more about that. But there's a whole bunch of ways that you can have accountability much quicker and much more in real time. And although it can be very helpful for the product owner to give stories and um, uh, acceptance tests and other things, those are great things to do. Don't get me wrong. TDD specifically is a way for engineers to be highly, highly accountable for what they're doing right now. And Basco, to themselves and to other engineers. Uh, mm -hmm. So that accountability is important because we need to first, we need to be accountable to ourselves. Like, am I doing what I thought I was doing? This is, it may seem like a stupid question, but when you're writing code, you really have to ask that. But because on computers top of are that, so autistic and so crazy that they'll do exactly what you ask them to do. Exactly. <laughs> they don't understand what you're trying to ask them to do. Uh, the, the other thing I would add to Daniel's question is that uh, product owners can become part of that accountability cycle by helping write acceptance tests, uh, like, you know, automated uh, executable acceptance tests. And uh, we don't even need to have POs only do that. We can actually do that with customers, right? There are frameworks and languages that help us to, you know, we sit down with customers, we write it down, they understand what we wrote down, we go back home and we can run those tests to make sure that what is happening is exactly what the customers thought should be happening. Great. And then we can show the results to the customers to say, look, you told us to do this and this is what it does. And they can say, oh, we didn't quite mean that. What a good and conversation. That's fine. Yeah, that's good. That's that's the outcome we want. Let me come to some other questions. I want to make sure to get to David, who was uh, really challenging us on certainty. Uh, so David asks, uh, uh, how do you start the conversation and convince, you know, I'm going to say, don't try to convince people. I'll come back to that. Convince stakeholders that require a degree of certainty uh, that continues to uh, influence their operational and resource planning. How do you expose just how uncertain the certainty is? Well, um, I'm, I'm again, not going to try to hack the tech um, uh, to, to show this, but um, it, it's in my book, Agile Conversations, and uh, I'll certainly post it on the forum as well. There's several examples. Uh, I have a concept called the tilted slider. And the tilted slider says um, that you have this slider that you can move up and down. Yeah, it's like a slider that used to control uh, radio um, You know, back in the 1970s. I remember these. I'm old. Um, uh, you could move it up and down. It would change what station you were listening to. You see these on digital um, uh, controllers, you know, mix boards and things like that. Um, and uh, you, this slider goes from uh, being productive to being predictable. And if you're um, NASA, if you're trying to hit the moon, you're going to be way down here at predictable. And if you're uh, um, a very small startup that's just experimenting as no customers, uh, you're going to be way up here at, pro at productive. The challenge is that it's tilted for a reason. Why on earth would you tilt your slider, right? The normal ones are, are horizontal. Um, but the, the reason it's tilted is that there's a force of gravity. And the force of gravity is the desire for control. And that tends to pull you down toward being more predictable. Because the people you're describing, these stakeholders that you're hoping to convince, are just requiring that degree of certainty almost certainly because they don't trust you. And if they or trust themselves you, sometimes or themselves or the customer, there's something, there's some lack of trust here. There's something that's pushing them to say, we need more control. We need more certainty. We need to get this. Go find out what that is first. Don't try to convince them. When you find out what that driver is, then you may be able to do something. I'm almost certain you can. If you're not sure, ask on the forum. I'll help you. That the, uh, the, what you can find out is that their actual driver is the last five projects all failed. 
and nobody delivered. And they're fearful about that. They want to build trust so that it doesn't happen again. And if you can address that, then you can move your slider much higher up toward uh, uh, productivity rather than predictability. What do you think, Vasco? Yeah, so <clears throat> certainty uh, in, in quotation marks, as, as David uses it, it's more a statement of what are the things that your customer values that they believe that they can achieve by knowing exactly what you will do. The problem is that it's not possible. It is impossible. The more certain you seek, the less certain you become. And the reason for that is that there's a direct um, interaction between the control that we desire, which Squirrel uh, uh, referred to, and the impacts on the system. And uh, small control actions have very large impacts over time in a product. So for example, if I go into a room and to make sure we deliver feature A, I take Squirrel out of the team and say, Squirrel, I need you for two days over here to make sure we deliver feature A. It looks like I'm just doing feature A when in fact I'm actually delaying stuff that is needed to deliver feature C. All the stuff I was doing over here. Suddenly I'm over here. That now you don't know yet, but it's going to explode in your face. So we, we do have to Um, And this is why feedback loops are so important. We do have to build into our way of working a manner, a process that gives us that constant feedback of where we are. And plans are not that. And this is the problem. We think that by looking at where we are and comparing it to plans, so, you know, plan versus actual in the project management terminology, we, we think that we know whether we are deviating or not. But here's the thing. There are projects that are very close to planning and, and, and actuals are very close until the end, and then they explode apart, right? That you, you Many of you probably know that phrase, uh, my project is 90% done. I hope the second half goes as well as the first half. Oh, yeah. We've right? all been so, there. So th- this certainty that you're being asked is probably something different. It's probably something like, can you guarantee that we will not spend more than X millions for this project? Right. Of course, I just can't guarantee what we will deliver, but I can guarantee we will not go over budget. Or it might be, can you guarantee that we will get these things for this project? And I say, yes, of course, we will get those things. I just don't know how long or how much it will cost. Right. And this is the thing. We need to look at certainty as a a multidimensional conversation. There we go. And if you have that dialogue that you find out what the certainty is coming from, that's going to help you understand it much better. Emily and Jessica come back to us with great questions on a topic I know that's near and dear to your heart, Vasco. So I'm going to let you hit this one first. And that is, uh, what is your view on story points and measuring points per sprint? Emily points out that she gets asked that to be accountable for efficiency. So is the team working efficiently? Do they do enough story points? And Jessica says, well, actually, we don't use the story points to measure efficiency. We use it to make the team think. So I wonder, what do you think about those two approaches to story points? Yeah, so first, the efficiency. Uh, Efficiency, I, I, I get the kicks out of discussing efficiency with people who dedicate their lives to measuring efficiency of software developers. And I'm not kidding. There are people who do that. There are PhDs and people who get paid quite a lot of money by large organizations to go in and measure efficiency. And I always ask, why would you care how efficient a software development organization is? Because what matters is how efficient the overall organization is. Let's say you go to a bank and you find out that their IT organization is super efficient. They're developing many lines of code per hour invested. They have very little uh, rework or you know bugs, so therefore they are very efficient. And then you look at their balance sheet and you see they're bleeding customers because nobody wants to use their bloody mobile app, which doesn't work half the time, or the website. That or, or take provide... the perfect example we're all reading about in the headlines. FTX had some pretty good code, some very clever developers building amazing cryptocurrency tools. I seem to have noticed that company's in trouble. So the, the code may have been super efficient. Not sure the organization did so well. And this is unfortunately a, a, an historic accident from having software development uh, kind of start to, or at least it intended to, be a little bit like construction. 
Mm -hmm. right we 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 want software development to be a little bit like construction and we want it so badly that we want to measure it the same way we measure construction now even construction is not measured like that these yeah, days construction but, isn't construction you don't do it that way in, but in, in but real beyond world. but beyond that we also have the point that efficiency cannot be measured locally it can only be measured globally and now any physic uh physicist you would mm -hmm. say yeah. right mm -hmm. any yeah. physicist knows that efficiency is a global system property it's not a property of a part of the system it's a property of the whole of the system and here we are talking about how to measure efficiency of one team which is you know nonsensical because what matters the efficiency of the organization as a whole hey, hey vasco i've got a really efficient air conditioning system in my in my car you know the fan goes around really fast you use hardly any energy so my car is really energy efficient isn't it because the fan that cools the car. <laughs> oh, is you super forgot fast. to mention the five liter diesel engine you have. Well, yeah, there's that. And, you know, that's running on wood and, and other stuff. <laughs> that, that the fan, boy, that's really good. And, and that's the crazy thing that, um, uh, that people wind up doing when they measure the efficiency of, of just one part of the system. But, but Vasco, I'm curious, what do you think about uh, Jessica's point? She says, look, we, we do this process. It's really helpful to us because we understand what we're going to do better. Yeah, I think uh, stop that, start doing slicing and count stories instead. It, that's what I write about in the book. And for an engineer, slicing a story down is a lot more brain intensive and also a lot more clarifying of the technical challenges than giving it a three or a five. And, you know, let's be honest, if, if, if your team is spending even five minutes discussing whether a story is a three or a five, then we should stop the discussion immediately and say, we probably don't understand this. So let's write a few acceptance criteria first before we point this story, right? So whenever there's a discussion, I would rather say, hey, let's work through the acceptance criteria. And if we don't agree at that time, then at least we can split it into different acceptance criteria, which is a, a slicing technique, by the way. So you get slicing for free if you have acceptance criteria. There you go. So Vasco, I'm going to slightly disagree with you in a second, but I just want to um, uh, elicit more questions because these are fantastic. We always get these great questions on the squadron, uh, Vasco. So I'm so grateful to the community for bringing us these these excellent provocative ideas. I've thrown away my notes already, so uh, we just have too many good good topics. So please add more if you want to get your questions in. We've got a few more minutes. Would love to cover more. Um, but but let me just take a moment to, to slightly disagree with Vasco. Um, so Vasco says, cancel your uh, backlog grooming. Cancel your your pointing and your um, point. I, I don't not not yeah. not the refinement. The point. Okay, good. This is where we do agree. Okay, fantastic. Because Jessica says, look, my team learns a lot from sitting down together and discussing what we're going to build, and I wouldn't cancel that. I think that's a fantastic discussion. That's going to really help you. And then you can discuss the acceptance criteria and what's in the slices, and you can do a demo, and you can do a lot of other things to get that fast accountability that we've talked about, the rapid learning loop. But what's not valuable is the part where you use kind of this excuse. There's this crutch um, that your team has. And uh, the crutch is, okay, well, now that we've had this really great discussion, let's decide whether it's a three or a five. You can just skip that part. And instead, you can come up with slices, acceptance criteria, all the bits that we've been talking about. And that's the outcome of your discussion. But keep the discussion, right? So don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Keep the discussion. That sounds really valuable, Jessica. I wish more tech teams would do that. Yeah, and uh, uh, one of the things that I want to highlight from this slicing discussion is that it's something that can help us at all levels of the requirements hierarchy. It helps us at the epic level. It helps us at the feature level, if you have that level, and it helps us at the story level. So it's something that helps us make decisions and especially prioritization and investment decisions at all levels of the requirements hierarchy. It's not something that only engineers need to do, but we also need product owners to know about that and to use that aspect in their own work. Fantastic. Okay. Um, I don't see any more questions coming in, except there's one from Emily that we're going to deal with to, to help uh, people know where to go next. Um, and uh, Emily asks, where can I send my engineers to learn about slicing? That sounds like a very useful thing to know about. Um, so I'm going to give you two sources. The first is um, I'm going to be writing an ebook on this very soon. So Emily, I'll make sure to send you a copy because uh, you're in the squadron, I think. Um, I think you're the right, Emily. I'll make sure you get a copy of that. But Vasco's written an entire book 
much longer, much more in depth than uh, than I'm going to have. So uh, you definitely and and his is actually published. I I'm just in the process of writing mine. So um, Emily, feel free to ask more in the Squadron forum uh, if you'd like detailed uh, answers. But Vasco, how do people get hold of you? How do they get hold of your book? How can Emily learn more about slicing from you? Yeah, absolutely. So first of all, I would like everybody to go and get the book for free. Uh, I, I'm not sure I can paste it in in the channels but i'm sure squirrel will be able to do that and i just gave him the link uh right now there's no uh uh no no catch if you go to that website you will enter your email and you will get the book so just go there and, and you will get the 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 whole book immediately Again, uh, I'm just I, getting that up on the screen now. It's also in the chat. And um, if you have any trouble getting any of this material, um, find me. My my uh, uh, phone number, email, and home address are on DouglasSquirrel.com. So don't worry if you're driving or something. You can always get it from me later. But uh, it's here in the chat and um, uh, here on the screen. Absolutely. And, and the second thing, if you want to follow uh, real stories from real people dealing with questions like this and others, you can follow me on the Scrum Master Toolbox podcast, available, of course, on, on the website, but also on everywhere where you get your podcasts. And we interview every single day of the week. We interview Scrum Masters, Agile Coaches, product owners, and, and we talk about these topics like planning and managing expectations, getting teams to slice, getting your retrospectives to actually have a positive impact in how you deliver software, et cetera. Fantastic. So just search Scrum Master Toolbox Podcast. If you, again, if you have any trouble, get in touch with me and I'd be happy to help you. I've been on Vasco's podcast. It's an excellent resource. So um, there's a whole bunch of different places, Emily, you can go. The ebook I'm going to send you and the material on the Squirrel Squadron Forum, Vasco uh, himself and his book um, and uh, his podcast. That should give you plenty of things. And uh, we've also got spammers showing up. So must be time to, to bring the, the podcast, to the, the, the live stream to an end. Vasco, thank you so much for a really stimulating discussion, really interesting and provocative. Uh, I hope we've annoyed some people and I hope we've made some people think. That's that's what I wake up in the morning trying to do. So drop your estimates, drop your planning sessions, um, uh, continue talking about your code and, and see if you can get to Mars, uh, maybe with a few detours along the way. Uh, wonderful to have you, Vasco. Thanks so much. Likewise. Thank you for having me. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Bye now.